Aloha. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island ER Physician. Today I'm joined by a good friend, Dr. Scott Miskovich, who's a family practitioner, uh, trained in the East, grew up in Pennsylvania like me, went to Harvard and Yale and Cornell, actually all three. He was become an expert in an area that's very important to our state, and that is the prescription drug epidemic. Uh, pills are being prescribed at record rates across the country. In Hawaii, like other states, we've had very serious concerns about overdose from prescription drugs. We've become so worried about it because in, I guess, an easy to uh, review statistic, more people died last year from overdoses on pain pills than people died from car accidents. So just two years ago, I reached out to some colleagues and friends, Scott being my most expert uh, colleague in this area, to look at solutions. We wanted to know what legislative solutions would be necessary, what medical discipline solutions would be necessary to implement in our state to help protect uh, young and old from this major problem. So Scott put together a work group of experts. He's gonna talk about that today. He's gonna talk about solutions where Hawaii can lead the country. Scott, good to see you. Good to see you, thanks for having me. You bet. Okay, so um, let's cut right to the chase. You really have uh, uh, done a very deep dig and dive right into this problem. Explain to us uh, why we're talking about prescription drug overdose issues. Well, you already alluded to a key statistic that we all know, that we now have more people that are dying from overdose. <coughs> Excuse me. Problem. More people dying from overdose from um, prescription drugs than we have from car accidents in the state. Wow. Excuse me. I'm gonna no problem. Grab a drink here. Yeah, and as Scott gets a sip, I wanted to share that um, when you see numbers like that and you wonder why is the medical community letting that happen, uh, we really uncovered many, many reasons uh, that nationally we're having this crisis. <coughs> One statistic that came to light was that though we have only 4% of the world's population in America, as many as 80% of all pain pills were being consumed by our citizens. So when you look at this problem as a doctor and an expert, what do you see? Well, we've, we've become a society that looks for immediate gratification. I mean, we're a hardworking country and people uh, want some results now. And back in the turn of the century, around 2000, there was a big push that pain we called the fifth vital sign, where, where people were pushed to say, you've got to pay attention to patients' pain. And then we had a big push from the pharmaceutical companies that were making statements that some of the pain medicines that were newer and cutting edge were not a problem. They weren't addictive and they weren't a problem. So the physicians were led through the experts at the time to say, hey, it's not a problem. Give people pain medicine. It's going to just take care of their problem. As a return, Americans said, okay, my pain's not as bad. I'm still working. But the problem was addiction. Uh, dependence and addiction became a huge issue. Have you seen, uh, as far as trends go, have you seen things change? You've been, a, you came to Hawaii in the 80s right. um, after finishing your, your training, and so you've experienced the, you know, the Hawaii medical climate in the 80s, the 90s, and the, you know, the 2000s, past decade. What's been kind of your perspective as a doc? Well, I think would really be amiss to not go a little bit away from the narcotic and the opiates and not mention what really still is our massive problem, and that's crystal methamphetamine. Yeah. And, um, and you know, we still, I would believe, are probably the meth capital of the United States. Uh, Dr. Or, uh, Judge Stephen Alm, who's just recently left the bench and uh, a terrific advocate with drug court, yes. has had in his drug courts, 90% still of his positive drug tests were coming with crystal meth. But the problem is, is that meth led to other, other uh, drugs. These people were also using opiates to counteract or to enhance methamphetamine, or that use benzodiazepines like Valium and other meds to come down off of it from there. So we now have an amazing culture where drugs are now in the form of crystal meth three generations into our family. Yeah. I have to tell you that, Josh, the most incredible thing for me is when I can sit and I can do a random urine drug test and I have positive methamphetamine and opiates on patients that shouldn't that are over the age of 70 and in the same family you can have an 18 year old there's three generations where this is passing through the family so it's so ingrained in the families uh, it's a huge problem right now yeah you you know you've really explained it very well because as you've told me on numerous occasions you have patients coming in with pain pain problems severe injuries drug addiction with the methamphetamine and heroines, pain pills that you're trying to help them work through their pain issues, but also to, to bring them down off of pain addiction. 
and then also these other drugs that people are getting off the streets in other ways. So you were able to bring together a lot of people to look at this as a kind of a multifactorial problem. And throughout the show, I'm hoping that we're going to get to even some of the um, social and cultural implications of this drug addiction concern. Who did you bring together? When I, you know, when I was able to reach out to you and say, hey, Scott, I think we've got a problem here, what kind of team did you put together so that we can start talking about this issue? Sure. I, you know, I like to qualify, too. I'm, I'm a family physician in Kaneohe. I'm not, you know, a certified addiction specialist, but I think credit your judgment to let me help lead this up because where I stand is I stand in the middle. You know, I represent my patient, yeah. and, and I represent the people of Hawaii and the people I serve. And, and so when you look at the group, we put together, for example, doctors from the pain association that are certified in pain that have special treatment to treat addiction. We have the University of Hawaii addiction psychiatry resident who are exactly on the other end who are saying no we have to deal with addiction and keep these people off. We have orthopedists, we have um, psychiatrists, then we go, we have all the health plans, the major health plans represented, we had the courts represented, we have the narcotic enforcement division, uh, we have medical directors from different independent organizations, we've reached out now and we have the nurse practitioners, we have the directors of all the pharmacies represented, we have independent pharmacists. The, the, I've, I strongly believe now because I have studied and I've been in contact with most of the organizations throughout the United States. We have the most broad scale, inclusive group of leaders than anywhere in the United States that are all coming together. And we're trying to let all of those voices come together to come up with what's best and safe for the patients of the, and people of Hawaii. And I think that was very smart when you did that because by bringing all these different perspectives to the table, some people from the clinical side, right. the reason I wanted you is because you see patients more than anybody. My interest was as an ER doc, I suppose. Um, but when you brought in the judges and the pharmacy individuals and the, and the insurance plans that have the data, the judge who was dealing with the people who would otherwise have to be incarcerated if we didn't get them better. I think all the perspectives were, were quite well balanced. Now, this group of experts has come together, and we're hoping, I think, that other states across the country will, will follow your lead, frankly, and bring these kind of coalitions together. I think it's happening in certain places. Um, what, was, what became evident to you right away? You know, in those first meetings, as you were looking at the scope of the problem, what were your first observations? My first observation, and it still is my observation, which makes me really proud of our leadership, is the commitment. Remember, these are all really busy people. These are experts in their fields. And we have attendance of over 95% for people coming together. The involvement, these people are not afraid to stand up. But the cohesiveness where everybody tries to be respectful of the other person's opinion. But I, again, it's just the heart and soul that everybody realizes that this is a problem, enough of a problem that they're going to take their private time away from families and come together. Okay, so that's just, I mean, it is extraordinary. And I've witnessed this with you, to the amount of commitment in time. So people now know the shape of this committee, which we're calling um, HOOLA, which is Hawaii Opioid and Overdose Leadership Action Workgroup, HOOLA. Uh, so the group's together. It's been together now for two years? Just over two years. Okay. Right. Uh, you had some successes. Uh, you were able to change policy. Why don't you run through some of the basic policy uh, concerns and issues that are, I guess, emerging? Um, the first two policy issues I think there have been successes with that and I want to also step out to say there's broad groups that have also stepped up to become part of making those policies a success uh, was dealing with a medication called naloxone. Okay. If you go up to the federal level and remember we're, I'm also helping to get information and working through the White House and we're working through NIDA and SAMHSA which are federal organizations this was the number one objective that they had to saving lives now. T tell, tell people out there who might not be in the clinical world uh, what does naloxone do? Okay, naloxone is an extraordinarily safe medication. It can be sprayed in the nose through a little uh, 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 device or it can be given as a shot and it immediately 
overturns an overdose. So it kicks out the medications that are in the receptor and it is one of the most dramatic things and as an emergency physician, you've used it, you've seen it. Sure. Someone can actually be blue and not breathing yes. and they can get naloxone and within 20 to 30 seconds, their eyes open and they're awake and they're breathing. Yes. So it is something that actually saves lives. The states who've instituted this, I believe we're the 37th, yes. um, are finding that it is the short, a very short-term uh, antidote. We want it in the hands of first responders. We'd like to get HPD to be considering to carry it. Our, our paramedics are carrying it. But our law has gone now to parallel the United States where we can give a prescription now to grandma. Yes. If she has a grandson that is using heroin or addiction where she's seen that they're not breathing, she can get a prescription from her physician, even though she is not the addict, but that's the first thing that we're doing to save lives. And I think that uh, that was featured very nicely um, in some of, by some of the news media uh, with Heather, right? Uh, what was she, Heather Lusk? Heather with, Lusk. Uh, she's been terrific with uh, Child Project. Right. right. So w this coalition now is growing. So just for those out there who might not spend as much time in the clinical setting as as you and I uh, do, if a person takes a bunch of morphine, if they take heroin, if they take lots and lots of pain pills and they overdose, this is a potential life-saving solution, remedy. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the bigger issues, we're very fortunate not to have as much of it running through the state, but, uh, but we have the Narcotic Enforcement Division yes. uh, team on our, our committee. We're starting to see a push up and we need to stop it before it becomes a real issue, and that's heroin. I mean, heroin, if you look at uh, some of the Appalachian states which are decimated, I mean, we have had, there is a county in West Virginia that had more deaths than our entire state from heroin overdose. Wow. I mean, so we don't let that, we don't want that to happen. Those, uh, that type of medication can really make a big difference. And I, I would imagine that those counties in West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania and Kentucky and everywhere where we're having these problems, they're going to probably benefit from some of the recommendations that you've been able to get implemented in our state because uh, when they see those kind of overdoses, it's not just going to be life-saving treatment when they get to the ER to see me or, you know, in the outpatient setting quickly to get care. A lot of times it's going to have to be delivered by those medics or the firefighters or, or the family members. And though that won't solve the person's addiction problem, it may buy them you know, one more opportunity to well, live. Uh, well, an opportunity to live and hopefully an opportunity to get into treatment, which is a, a whole other topic that is part of what we're going to be trying to address to broaden treatment options. Absolutely, and yeah. I, I can't wait to discuss that in a moment because in, in the course of some of my committee hearings at the health committee over the years, it was brought to my attention that at the moment, we only treat 3.3% of all uh, necessary addiction treatment. So our capacity is very low we just don't have enough providers and we don't have enough coverage from insurance in general. I think we have to change the paradigm in the healthcare system and treat people, get them over their addiction when we can, rather than incarcerate them, rather than watch them go down the fatal road of additional addiction and overdose. Okay, so uh, we're actually coming quite close to the halfway point of our show. You passed the, um, you got the recommendation out. We had very good help from Senators Baker, Representative Bellotti, lots of legislators. Uh, Let's finish this point up on naloxone. Also, liability. People can give it without the concern of being sued? Correct. They can give it without being sued if someone is overdosing and it's actually two other pre people that are present that are also under the influence of the same medication. Yes. They can call. They can use it without being arrested to you know, save the life of that individual. It's very, very critical that we broaden the education to the public and broaden the education and access to the public with this. That's excellent. Okay, so we're um, partway through our show. I'm Josh Green, uh, Healthcare in Hawaii's host, ER physician and senator. I'm joined today by Dr. Scott Miskovich, who is uh, one of my favorite people and who's a leader leading the group HOOLA, Hawaii's Opioid and Overdose Leadership Action Work Group. We are putting together a plan to make sure that we can protect people from overdose deaths and from this epidemic of prescription drug addiction. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, 
where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. It's summertime in Honolulu, Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm your host for Shrink Wrap Hawaii. We're on every Tuesday at 3 o'clock, and we talk about mental health and general health. Join us. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Hibachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island and ER Doc. I'm joined today by Dr. Scott with Dr. Scott Miskovich, terrific gentleman who's a family practitioner, leader in uh, kind of a new emerging and concerning field, which is how to deal with policy questions related to the drug, uh, the drug epidemic, the prescription drug epidemic in our state. I uh, mentioned earlier in our first segment that more people died in Hawaii from drug overdose than they did from car accidents. That was a uh, kind of an eye-opening moment. It lit a fire under us. We decided to put together a policy group, which Scott's leading. He's brought together judges, experts in pain management, physician leaders, pharmacy leaders, uh, leaders from the health insurance industry who really know the data, many other groups, those who lead in hospice care, all of the experts that you would expect on such a panel. In the first couple years of this group, we've already passed legislation to change kind of the tone and discussion on how to keep people alive. People who overdose now can get a medicine called naloxone by prescription to basically reverse the effects of a, a potentially life-threatening overdose. But that's not the end of it. This is just the beginning of the process. Other legislation and recommendations came, correct, Scott? Correct. Talk to us about uh, the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, we call it the PDMP, but to be uh, descriptive, when a person gets a prescription, there is a database we're able to log on to to find if that person has received other prescriptions from other pharmacies. Unfortunately, when people do have a problem with addiction, they do something called doctor shopping, meaning they'll go to one doctor to another doctor, and they, in some cases, could see 10 different doctors in a, in a week. And there have been circumstances in patients that I've you know, worked with the Narcotics Enforcement Division on where they may get 2,000 to 3,000 pills of something like a Percocet set. Uh, those can be used for their personal consumption or that could be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of street value of medication. Wow. And that's how these pills are getting spread out all over society. They could be found in almost any park, any bus stop. They're, they're, they could be found throughout our state. They're getting down into our, our middle schools. So oh, yeah. that's, uh, that's a concern. Well, it's a brief vignette about that. Uh, I was contacted by a physician in Hilo and they told me that kids were getting pills on the black market or on the street, crushing um, oxycodone tablets and putting them in Coca-Cola and then sipping it and getting high all day long. And we were seeing overdoses as well. So these were, these were middle schoolers and high schoolers. So what you describe is something that's familiar to me on the Big Island. Okay, so the PDMP, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, my understanding was it was out there, but it wasn't effective yet or wasn't being used. What did you recommend and what are we doing now? Well, there's a couple things. It's a multi-tiered approach. The bill we got passed basically helped to increase funding for the Narcotic Enforcement Division to upgrade to a much more modern um, uh, uh, database and a, uh, a contractor right. who is going to now start to available work over the next couple of years to get the data pushed out to the doctors, which is something we heard the physician community asking. But the other thing is now, the doctors are required to sign up for the database. Now that is different than being required to use it. Yeah. So that is one of the things we're now trying to work with the State Medical Association because really to be effective, you've got to use this. Yeah. And I would like to bring up a perfect example. New York State mandated that their physicians use it. Within an 18 month period after it became law, uh -huh. they had a 37% decrease in the county of the uh, borough of Manhattan of the number of pills in circulation. Amazing. So that's one of the measurements we're going to look at. We need to decrease the total number of pills that are in circulation by all measures. Yes. Uh, and this is one of them. That's amazing. And it's very rare that you see a change that dramatic in such a short, short period, period of time. time. Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's got to be discussed. I, you know, my experience, is, and I think it's very similar to yours, is I see patients all the time. A lot of times, real pain. Someone comes in with a terrible fracture 
got bone cancer. Of course, that is not the concern I have. But not a shift goes by where I meet a patient for the first time that's many, on many occasions has come in from the mainland. They are now only in Hawaii for a couple months. They haven't found a provider yet, and they want a very large prescription. And when I look into it, I find very quickly what you described, which right. is they've had two or three prescriptions already. I, I don't want to be uh, tough or too hard here, but in that particular case, they were trying to pull one over on the dock. And we didn't need to see all those extra pills in their system or in the systems of our, our teenagers and children. And, and that's why your solution is so valuable. Do you expect that we will have to, in the coming years, you know, enhance the PDMP, make it mandatory under some circumstances? Is that something that we should be talking about? Um, I believe we will. I believe that right now we're probably going to be first working on improving the technology, which has been a little bit cumbersome. Uh -huh. And I do believe for this to be effective, if we can get the data to be pushed out using the electronic records, using iPhones and other things, that it will become mandatory, especially for people who are on chronic medication. Yeah. Like some of the best practices, for example, what we do in our practice based on what is going on in some of the best practices across the country. If anybody is getting medication at the beginning, we get it yeah. to see if they have other prescriptions. And then every three months, we, we pull a PDMP or if there's some change in behavior that makes us wonder, I lost my prescription, oh, the dog ate it, or yeah. oh, geez, it just doesn't work, I need double the amounts, things that we would never do, we start to look, or even a behavioral change. So, so you're it, saying it's just good medicine. It's good medicine. Yeah. It's, it helps the patient. Yeah, it's and, and you came up with a very good idea in the course of our work together where you recommended that we have a delegate. So a team member on the staff can also right. help check. This thing, just for people out there, if they're healthcare providers or, or even uh, lay people, it takes two minutes to check this. It's um, online and you have a password. You check it, the information comes up. Uh, it's not quite in real time yet. I think it's backdated about seven days. We're, we're working on that. I understand we need to fund our guys better to get that to real time. Technology's improving, it's gonna happen. Uh, but I guess the idea is we get there, you have the delegate that's able to help that doc or the nurse practitioner, whoever's prescribing the medications, you're going to catch up. In the New York case, proves true, 37 percent. In, in an ideal situation, when the doctor's logging into their computer, it should flash and just hit them right in the face and Excellent. let them know that, did you know your patient just filled up a prescription? If you, try to, if you push this button to renew it, yes. they already have had one just three days ago. That's really what we're trying to push for, yeah. and I think we would get broad support from the rest of the physician community on. So. It's, it's coming, and yeah, you already got a lot of people yeah. on board. Yeah. Uh, other, give me a couple other examples of um, proposals that you'd like to see that would make a difference. Uh, I'm very, very big, and we're going to be pushing hard for generally what we call informed consent. Okay. In healthcare, we have to understand we have approximately, um, say, for example, some people are getting a medication like a Percocet or Oxycodone and something like a Valium. Yes. Six times the increased risk of overdose when you combine those two. It is one of the biggest national uh, best practice data points we're, we're putting out there. Don't do it or be very careful. I think the doctor has an obligation to look that patient in the eye and explain to them, hey, if I'm giving you these two prescriptions and you decide to take them together or feel they're not working and take another or wash them down with a beer or two, you're gonna die or you could die. Yes. So telling patients the risks of being on meds. When you start someone on a new medication, a lot of patients think, oh, it's a pain med my doctor gave it to, it must be safe. Well, there are certain people genetically or who are gonna quickly Yes. be addicted to that med. So I think we have an obligation to inform the consumer along those lines. There are, there are basic, very user-friendly um, informed consent uh, agreements that the doctor and the patient sit down and go over before they start. I'm a big believer that that should be happening across our state. That's excellent. Okay, so naloxone saves people from overdose. PDMP helps doctors and nurse practitioners and other providers make sure that we're not putting too many pills into circulation or getting in some cases, the wool pulled over our eyes when someone's doctor shopping. Three, informed consent, teach people that it's gotta be safer. I've heard some talk about take back programs. That say, you know, it's an easy thing to do, take bills out of circulation. I, I'd like to take it further and I'd like to be the first state in the country that does something even more uh, progressive. And, and I'd like to tell the listeners, 50% 
of all the medications that are taken illegally are taken out of the family's medicine cabinet. 50 percent. Wow. Only 25 percent are coming directly from a doctor and 25 percent are coming actually from the streets and being bought. So families have the option to be, do their part and we do have drug take back programs but the problem is if someone's bringing their old amoxicillin that's not stopping addiction. Yes. I want to have narcotic specific drug take back programs and I want to create some incentives for people to bring their narcotics in to get those off because that will be something that will also reduce overdose deaths. So we're going to be pushing that too. That's excellent. And once again, we're going to have to support our drug enforcement groups yep. and Department of Health and the administration will be there for them. You've mentioned some interesting things to me as we come down the kind of home stretch of our program today, um, Dr. Scott. You know, You've said to me that you've witnessed over these last two or three decades uh, homeless concerns um, that have kind of overlapped in some ways with um, behavioral health problems, with mental illness, with drug addiction. And I think you've spoken more eloquently than most people on this matter. Could you unpack that a little bit? Because we all know, those who are watching, those who will see this in the coming days, we all know that homelessness has been at a crisis uh, level in Hawaii for the last certainly the last couple of years. It's been in some ways the, the most visible issue. Uh, you've told me that it's very intimately tied with some of the work that you're doing. Could you break that down? I, I absolutely believe it, it, uh, it is the, the cause. And, you know, I take it back even further. Homelessness is not a single event. Homelessness is a process. And, and I believe that the future homeless are actually in every doctor's office and everybody's family and living room right now. There are processes that are occurring that are eventually leading people to become homeless. And as we know with the, own st the statistics that were just published from 2015, at least 50% of the people that are homeless right now, unsheltered, have severe mental illness. 70% have some form of addiction. Many of them have dual diagnosis. And so, when you treat these patients and you're with them, I have over 100 homeless patients in my practice and wow. have for a while and I have a, so I, I sit and spend so much extra time to try to understand how did you get there? How do we get you out of there? Mm -hmm. And the ones who are no longer homeless, how did it happen? You then realize that until we get to the root cause of addiction, um, and help treat their mental illness, we're never going to solve homelessness. And that's the people who are already out there. Right. We need to reach back further as in any other process. We need to start aggressively stopping that conveyor belt to homelessness. We need to start with stopping people from becoming addicted in the first place. Yes. And that's also looking at the crystal meth, and, uh, which is also a big part of that, which is uh, what we need to, we've almost, we're almost blind to meth in Hawaii now because it's been here so long. Right. But my belief is addiction is the, the probably single largest root cause more than not having enough homes to our problem. Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that you um, have been focusing on that because I think what many people, at least in the medical community, and I think a lot of a lot of civilians out there not in medicine, they see it happen before their very eyes. They see a person's life come apart. They don't know why. Right. Later on, they find out they were severely addicted. And then sometimes families, and it's true of all of us, doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, black or white. It, it can unravel the, the bonds between parents and children and, and loved ones because addiction is so hard to treat. And before you know it, when life gets totally out of control, when addiction and then theft occurs and then violence in the home and then people are sent to the wind, they become those homeless individuals that unfortunately may only be a statistic in many people's mind, but really they're casualties of this prescription drug epidemic and the methamphetamine epidemic. And your opinion has been uh, resonating with me. Solve that problem or else we're never going to solve the homeless problem. Absolutely agree. And I want to tell you just a personal note. People ask me, well, why are you so passionate about this? Why do you devote your time? And, and I would tell you that one of the most uh, sad things I see in my practice I'll get a longtime patient who will come in who will be 70, 72, and they'll bring in adoption forms for me. And you kind of tilt your head and say, you're 72, why are you adopting? Well, I'm adopting my grandchildren. Why are you adopting your grandchildren? Well, my son and the mother, the children, they're nowhere to be found. They're addicted to meth, they're in prison, they've been in and out of rehab. 
Josh, I have over 150 grandparents that have adopted their grandchildren because their parents are so far into and out of, you know, being involved with their children. I mean, everybody knows somebody like that. So, I mean, when I see that, it's, I stand up and say, why? That's why. That's one of the reasons why. It's a fantastic uh, message to end on, which is to say, uh, we're here today talking about uh, the prescription drug epidemic, and we've now been able to also uncover its connections to homelessness and really many devastating moments in society. But the good news is we've got an expert in our midst, which is Dr. Scott Miskovich and his team of uh, collaborative uh, experts across the state. Ho'ola, Hawaii Opioid and Overdose Leadership Action Workgroup is on the issue, it's on the problem. We'll have solutions for society in the coming months and years. Thanks for joining us at Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green.